it's easiest to talk about and to demonstrate waves that are in one dimension, waves on a string, sound waves in a pipe, but real life waves go in two and three dimensions as well. So some examples of two dimensional waves that we're probably familiar with are ocean waves and the surface earthquake waves. So we've seen animations of both of those in cross section. But in reality, ocean waves are on the surface of the water and they spread out in two dimensions. And earthquake surface waves are the same thing. Now there are also earthquake waves that travel through the earth, um, both transverse and longitudinal types of those. And those are three dimensional waves. Waves on a membrane also are two dimensional waves. You can imagine if you have a stretched membrane and you disturb it in some section, you strike it in some section, then the waves will spread out from the point of the disturbance, just like the waves will spread out from a rock thrown into a pond. I want to talk a little bit about water waves because they're the kind of waves that we see the most in our everyday life, but they also turn out to be extremely complicated waves to describe scientifically and mathematically. I'll just qualitatively talk a little bit about how water waves behave. So with water waves, the two forces acting on the wave is the pressure from the fluid, from the water, and from gravity. Gravity is pulling the crest of the waves down, and pressure is pushing the troughs of the waves up. Here's a simulation of what happens in a water wave. You'll see the individual particles are moving in circles. So it's a combination of a longitudinal and a transverse wave. It moves up and down and side to side. Notice that in the crest of the wave, the particles are moving forward in the trough backward. Water waves travel faster in deep water than in shallow water. If the water is shallower than the wave basin, there'll be a lot of drag between the bottom of the wave and the bottom of the sea. So when a wave reaches shallow water, when the depth of the water is less than the wave base, then the wave is going to slow down considerably. Also, another weird thing about water waves is that the speed depends on the wavelength and on the amplitude. So the longer the wave, the faster it moves. The higher the wave, the faster it moves. And you can kind of understand that because the restoring force is gravity. The higher the wave, the greater this restoring force is going to be. So water waves tend to be quite complicated in their behavior. One thing that we observe with water waves a lot, since we often interact with them at the seashore, is braking behavior. So what this is showing is the different steps in the braking of a wave. In the shallows by the shore, the waves start to slow down. And when that happens, the wavelength will shorten and the amplitude is going to rise because there's still the same amount of energy in the wave. To the crest of the wave, the water is quite a bit deeper than it is to the trough of the wave. So the troughs tend to be slowed down more than the crests. The crests will outrace the troughs and fall forward. And that's when you get the breaking wave. And depending on how fast it falls forward, you can get a tube, uh, something you can surf with, or you might just get what you call a plunging wave. There's all sorts of different ways that the wave can break. 